Just quickly, before you get into the episode, the name of the podcast has changed from The Big Small to Working With Wildlife. The name has changed, but the content is still the same. So now that we got that out of the way, let's carry on with the episode. I even was bringing stuff back from Vietnam. Yeah, right on. We got a permit to do it, but I was supposed to fly home, mm. but they were short of cooks and I was a cook. So I said, would well, you mind going home on the ship? I said, oh, ship trip's good for me. Mm. But then somebody on the ship, I didn't make a secret. I had these animals. Mm. I had a reticulated pythons and bloody a few other things, like mainly the pythons, and I was Amazing. bringing them home. Yeah. And someone found out and the captain made me throw them overboard. No. Because under orders, you are still in war zone. <laughs> they just follow the, the anything that wants to go and the more spectacular it is, the more they want to believe it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And what I found is to be more real and I want to tell people the truth. Welcome to the Big Small Podcast, where I speak to adventurers, advocates and authorities in nature and we talk about the small things in life's big picture. I'm your host, Jaden Lunt, and my guest today has starred in two TV series, but many more series and episodes, uh, well over a hundred in fact, of which have been translated over 30 times. Once after watching a couple of these episodes, I proceeded to bring a redback spider to school because uh, I knew that it wouldn't hurt me if it didn't feel threatened. But when the principal found out, he wasn't exactly happy and he called my mum in. We had one of those parent-teacher interview things and uh, it was um, where I got in trouble that is anyway. I don't actually know what happened to the spider. But you may otherwise know him as the barefoot bushman. Please welcome Rob Brettel. G'day. Rob, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is an absolute uh, honour and Not pleasure. a problem, not a problem. Now, uh, to start off, could you give us an introduction to who you are, what you are and what you are about <laughs> as best you can? <laughs> well, as I say, Rob Brettel, barefoot bushman and uh, born into zoos. My father was a reptile freak, came from Europe to Australia and his first day caught a brown snake in his work and took it home and basically started a zoo, one yeah. of the first private zoos in Australia. And I just grew up with animals, put it that way. Yeah, you did really well. And during the course of my life, went to the army, went to Vietnam, got photos in the War Museum with snakes and stuff like that, and then came back, went to Edward River at a crocodile farm where I lived with Aboriginals for 10 years. Yeah. And these Aboriginals were only found in 1938, so they were wild people. Yeah, yeah. And the men I went bush with were the Aboriginals who had killed other men in other tribes in yeah. their lifetime. Yeah. And I spent a while then and found out, you know, the truth about Aboriginal, put it that way. And yeah. basically it did sort of influence my life a bit because they're very, what I call real people, and they just live in the day. Yeah, in the moment sort of That's thing. right, in the right. moment. That's it, you know. No exaggeration and, you know, no bullshit as we call it. So it sort of had an influence on my life too, you know, yeah. basically, yeah. Hey, so you spent ten, ten years... Ten um, years there with a the croc farm, the yeah. croc farm. And um, talking before, you had um, three croc men from... Uh, the yeah, well, the Aboriginal... There were 12 tribes there and the old man, when he went, he decided that he'd employ the people whose totem was the crocodile because they might know something about crocodiles and might help in the establishment of the farm. But yeah. their stuff is more mythology than as it might okay. be, so that yeah, really okay. didn't make much of a difference, but it was interesting. Yes, yeah, okay. And um, with uh, the the crocodiles, and this has kind of been your life, it's like you're the man who sits on the back of the crocodile, yeah. uh, it's quite a feat yes. uh, to see. Well, to give you an idea, we, we got our first crocodile when I was about nine into our zoo in South Australia in Renmark, and we actually believed what we'd heard about crocodiles and we turned him into a guard dog. Mm. You know, intentionally, oh, they're fast and all this sort of shit. But then when I went and worked with them up there, found out just about everything we'd heard about was not true. But it, right. it didn't make much of a, it didn't take much to learn. It was sort of called critical thinking. Mm. And um, when the old man started catching the snakes, of course, that was out of the ordinary because the only good snake was a dead one in Australia. Snake. So all of a sudden there's a bloke, you know, that's keeping snakes in his backyard and... and, you know, the tiger snake will attack you and chase you. And it didn't take us long to realise that just about everything you've ever heard about snakes is not true. They're deaf, they're blind, mm. they can't run. We're about eight to nine tonnes of the average snake, so... <laughs> on average, no, yeah. <laughs> there's no, you know, I think if you come up an eight tonne elephant, you're not going to bite on the foot because you're poisonous. You step on your head, you're dead. So it didn't take us long to realise if everything you heard about them is not true and like the a blue tongue bites, you go out and bites, the straw break out every year. This is all the stuff you hear about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And none of it's true. Yeah. But everyone seems to go along with this. And mm. I... I so I think people are a bit like sheeple. They just follow the, the anything that wants to go. And the more spectacular it is, the more they want to believe it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And what I found is to be more real and I want to tell people the truth. Right. So my playing with the crocodiles looks quite dangerous, but 
But what I've done is I've looked at the crocodile, I've seen what he can do and what he can't do, and I used, yeah, yeah. then I've used his instincts against him, mm. or to my advantage, so I use it. So to learn to put my finger in a crocodile's mouth, you know, over the years I've played with him, I use a stick, and if you touch a crocodile on the head with a stick, you know, a hundred times he doesn't react, you think, well, one day, well, if I do it with my finger, it doesn't react, well, same thing. Yeah. You know, so you've got to work on their instincts. Right. And you, you know, when you can, then you can actually work with the animal and use them to your advantage. So no matter where I go in the world of my documentaries, I can work out an animal pretty quick. Yeah, okay. And then I can, you know, use what I know yeah, what to my know advantage. That? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and most people want to, well, I can tell this, nearly every other park in Australia mm. that has crocodiles has what I call guard dog crocodiles. Right, okay. They're made to rush out the water for their meal or they don't get filled or jump around and all this sort of stuff. And in Memphis, they're faster than a horse over 50 metres. Mm. But every time you see someone feeding them, even like Steve Irwin, he'd be walking backwards and a crocodile's running at him and it can't catch him. Mm. So can he walk backwards faster than a horse can run forwards, you know, 50 okay. metres? So you, when you look at it that way, so what do you think? It's stupid. Yeah. Crocodiles are waiters and they wait for their dinner to come to them. Right. So if you leave the crocodile bear crocodile, you take his dinner to him. If you watch any of my YouTube things where I go and put my hand in the water, lift a crocodile out of the water. Yeah, I see that. That's a wild crocodile yeah. caught from the wild. Right. You know, <laughs> and you think, how can he do that? Well, yeah. I've just left the crocodile bear crocodile, and if it doesn't splash it to him, it's not alive, mm -hmm. so he's not going to react. Right. Okay. So it's there's the splashing and the reaction. That's is, is right. What, is what really Even draws when in When I was attention. in the crocodile farm at Edward River, you learnt very quickly. We had a, well, we had to. Put it this way, we had to skin 30 crocodiles out of a pool with 100 or so in them. And we only wanted the males. And we'd already tagged them with a yellow tag for the female okay. and a red, or it was a red tag for the female and a yellow tag for the male. So we went into this water. These crocs are nearly eight feet long, yeah. 2.4 metres, up to 2.4 metres. Yeah. And yet, once you caught a couple uh, when you're feeding, they'd freak out and all go to the water, just sit in the bottom. Yeah, okay. You walk in then, feel with your feet, feel for a crocodile. Put your hands down on his tail, or wherever you felt him. Mm. Okay, feel up to his head. Lift his tail up. Oh, yellow tag. Well, I can have that one. Mm. Then I'd put my fingers on his ears and put a 22 rifle between my fingers and shoot him in the head, drag him out. Right. I got touched once. Right. Doing that. It's true. You know, but that's. In the croc farm. Yeah. Yeah. So, if, like, once they're crocodiles and leave them there, you learn what they can and can't do. Yeah, wow. You know? Like, I've had teeth in me 40 times and I've only been bitten once. Yeah, and that was quite the situation. And some of them, mean, you know, 12, 10 foot crocs that had me, but yeah. I called them love bites because they were either fright bites or a bite where they grabbed me and I just let it go and pull it out, you know. Yeah. And when you're feeding a croc with a dead piece of meat, he's not biting as hard as he could. Mm. So yeah, even if I had my mouth in a croc, and I've, I've had in a 14 foot croc's mouth before, mm. and it, but he didn't crush it because it was a dead piece of meat. It was wait till he wanted to go for another swallow and then pull my hand out. Yeah, yeah. That's happened on occasion. Like yeah. I was hand fed hundreds of thousands of the devils, yeah. you know, and literally handled thousands, tens of thousands, oh, and caught hundreds of big ones in the, yeah. from the wild. Yeah, and I've seen some of your photos. They're quite some spectacular. Yeah, that's right. Uh, some of the, um, and also, there's a lot of myth around crocodiles. Uh, yeah. For example, like size um, exaggeration. Oh yeah. There was um, a, a photo in one of your in one of your books uh, of uh, a man sitting behind a croc with a gun. That's right. Up against, and then he's saying it was twenty four uh, feet. Twenty four feet crocodile. Uh, yeah, and um, but when you mathed up the the size of the gun, the rifle, yeah, yeah, in comparison to the crocodile, it wasn't actually that. That's right. That it's big. a bit like when you catch a fish and you hold it at arm's length in front of you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It looks much, much bigger. That's only one metre. Yeah. And he's got the boat behind him, which is a 12-foot boat. It looks twice as long as the boat's a couple of metres behind the croc. And I say, oh, yeah, it's a 12-foot boat. It's got to be a 24-foot croc. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what is an exaggeration. Yeah. And it come, it's easy to do because everything in the world works mathematically, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And if you take any object, no matter what it is, and you double its diameter, and you double its height, mm -hmm. it will be eight times heavier. So if I get a man twice your height mm. and just double everything on your body, it will be eight times your weight. Mm. Looks more than just twice as big, doesn't it? Yeah. Because it is eight times the volume. Yeah. Same as a croc. Eight foot crocs, you know, 80 odd kilos. 16 foot is nearly a ton. Mm. 800 kilos it's crazy, plus. crazy, a ton worth of crocodile. Yeah. There you go. So yeah. that's what it works like. And he's going to look bigger. And you can go to a zoo and they'll show you a, a, a 10 foot croc laying alongside a 15 foot. I can tell you the 15 foot is 20 foot and you'll believe me. Mm. Because it looks so much bigger. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It looks so much bigger. That's right, but it's only the volume that makes it. Right, okay. 
Um, and then with um, uh, the uh, Aboriginal tribes that you're living up in, um, your I've forgotten the name of the crocodile. The the Edward uh, River. Edward River. Yeah, the Ed- Edward River. It's um, called Pomparau now. Pomparau. That's right. They they've changed it. Um, how what how was uh, getting the 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 building of the park of the farm um, was that challenging working in a crocodile environment? Uh, no, not really. Like initially, because you were starting out, or oh, well, there were bugger all crocodiles there. It was funny how it started because the old man went with this guy called Doctor Busted. They'd done research on crocs in West Australia, New Guinea, and got them to you know protect them mm. in a certain way. In New Guinea, only up to a certain size you could over a certain size you wouldn't let it take to protect the breeders. They were good in that way. But anyway, he wanted, this bloke wanted to start a, a turtle farm in the Torres Strait Islands. The old man said, how would we make a croc farm? He said, oh, okay. It was from the ANU, Australian National University. So the old man got $7,000 mm. in 1970 to start a crocodile farm. So mm. he went around some communities and settled on Edward River for some reason. Don't know why. And people there said, oh, you yeah, can't start a crocodile farm. You know, so he said, oh, yeah. he, he hired a boat, went out that night and brought back eight little crocodiles. Yeah, the farm started, he said. Put a half a water tank down and stuck them in. Here's the farm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. That easy, straight yeah. up. Okay. Yeah, just like that, you know. Yeah. And so you've, uh, you've had Edward River. You've had t- two other um, parks? Yeah, after Edward River, I came out and made a park in Cardwell. Yes. We were there for eight years. Uh, it was called Breddles Zoo Cardwell. Mm-hmm. And then we were asked to come down to Early Beach. We had one zoo in Early Beach at, at one spot, then we shifted to another spot, and now we're down in Bloomsbury. Yeah. So really, it's nearly five. <laughs> yeah. Five, five yeah. separate entities, yeah. Um, has each time, um, what is like the, the main focus of each park being? Mainly education to people to give them the truth. Mm-hmm. To show them that snakes are deaf and blind and can't run and crocodiles are not mean, nasty, conniving, cunning creatures. That they're just an animal that works on instinct alone and yeah. you can easily live with these creatures if you understand them. Yeah and leave them be what they are. I mean, if you were brave enough, or not brave enough, but if you had, say, a black snake or brown snake living in your backyard, mm. and you happen to walk past it often enough and not go near it and annoy it, eventually you'd be able to step over that bloody snake and he won't move. Yeah. He'd be so used to you that you're not a threat to him. Mm. He's not a threat to you because he's like, you're so big. He'd just accept that. Okay. So that's the same with the bloody crocodiles. You yeah. can do the same thing, you know, if you learn to live with them. But what you've got to remember with the crocodile is that he's big enough to eat and he will eat you if you give him a chance if he's hungry. Yeah, they are. There's some and it's so things, funny yeah. because if you come in Queensland, they'll tell you never feed crocodiles because it will cause them to become a danger. And that's not true. Mm. It's actually the opposite. If you were to go in and feed crocodiles at a certain spot, and they would learn that. Yeah. And they would always come on the surface of the water for their food. But if a crocodile hunts you, he's not coming on the surface. Because yeah. if you see him coming, you're going to stand there. He'll yeah. be coming underwater to where you are. Yeah. And then our park, that's what we did. We do a, an attack show with the one that got me. Mm. We make him go underwater to where you are and then feed him there. So people can say, well, he's coming and you can't see him coming. If you leave them, be what they are. And that's the reason I can do the croc with a hand. Because if I'm not splashing, to him it's not a live piece of meat. Yeah. I'm yeah. just unlucky not to get away with this one too because... Shock, I suppose, and he was one that was. It was a, I've written in my book anyway why it happened, how it happened. Yeah, yeah. It was a brain fart that day. Don't often have them, but no. sometimes you do. Yeah, yeah. Lots of things attributed to it. Yeah. None of them entirely to blame. I don't no. blame any of us. No. It was my fault. I had a brain fart. And like I said, when 60 Minutes did the program, mm. even though they paid me fairly well to do it, mm. you know, I said, I'm not going to do it if you say the croc attacked me. Yeah, okay. So that, that, that's, that's honourable. That's, that's yeah, right. right. I said, it wasn't a croc attack. Yeah. I had a brain fart. He did what comes natural. <laughs> you know, he bit me and I got away with it. Yeah. You know, so it's as simple as that. Yeah, it did. And even though some other people have been bitten by crocs in other zoos, I feel for them because if anyone was going to bit, it should have been me because I'm the one that does that sort of stuff. Yeah, they really, really... And, and in, I, but I knew how to get away with it, you know, and... Yeah. and, and these other ones, the poor ones that get, well, there's a girl got bit a month or so before I did in, in the zoo up in Townsville and she got her arm really twisted up badly. She was actually coming in while I was there. The same bloke that treated me treated her. All oh, right. But being an eight foot croc, it really smashed the hand up. Yeah. At least with mine, his teeth were big enough to make the dotted line like toilet paper. Right. Which means there was no damage to me all over my shoulder, only the wrist. Because <laughs> it just ripped it off. That's right. 
So fun and games. Yeah, yeah, fun and games. Uh, yeah, a game I'd like not to play. No, I'll leave it up to that's the professionals. Right. Now I should know what it feels like. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. And with um, uh, this this these parks you've had and your your kids, um, the in the uh, way that they've grown up is quite unique. Yeah, um, and quite well, cool. yeah, they've got no choice. Like I had no choice. <laughs> Look, yeah. it was funny because my old man made his first trip to Queensland when I was probably. Nine. Yeah, okay. He, he, he came back with a taipan and a little crocodile. Mm. What but he a, had what a he had to come back with. Yeah, but he had no <laughs> heating place to have these things. Okay. So those days we had wood burning stoves uh. and he had this taipan in a box mm. and the croc was only about no, around a metre and a bit. And between the taipan box and the stove there was a gap and mum was cooking over a taipan and a crocodile while he was building somewhere. What a mum. <laughs> That's right. Gosh. That's in one of the documentaries we say that, you know, yeah. that we showed people out in one of our documentaries we did that. That's how it was. There was no choice. Yeah. In fact, we kids were really lucky because when he built the new snake house, we managed to get the old snake house as our room. <laughs> oh, what an upgrade. Yeah, right. And so did you have, like, were there enclosures in that, in the snake house? Or was it just a, a house just... It was there in the snake house with cages in it. Okay, right. He took the cages out, we built a new snake house, okay. and then we, we got this room as our bloody... As our room, yeah, me and my brother. Out. So we had a yeah, we had a swap over. Oh, that was a win. Yeah, it was a win. Yeah. Like, and like we had the a, like a pit full of snakes, as, and we were probably 11, 12 maybe. Yeah. People had come, and there were sack bags with twenty or thirty tigers and browns under it. We could jump in and lift the bags up and move these snakes around so people could see the bloody things. We only yeah. ten and twelve nowadays. So, oh, he was a bad parent, you know. Mm. That's really dangerous. Mm. No shoes. Like I said, the only time <laughs> I've ever been bitten by a snake was when I'm feeding them. <laughs> never any other time. Yeah. Yeah. When you yeah, I've never been caught bitten catching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, handling or showing off. I had it, the first type and it was showing off with a little type end. Bit me in my thumb and left a fang, and that was a Deadwood River. <laughs> yeah, right. Back in the then. middle of nowhere. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you still and you still made it out alive. Oh yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Now you um, also you mentioned before um, that with how your the park kind of started off was that your dad collected a bunch of wildlife. Not a bunch. What he did he? Yeah, yeah well, he went his first day in work. He caught catches a brown snake. Yeah, he brings it home, puts it in a box. Then during the other times, he was working the fruit farms in Randwick in South Australia, mm-hmm. a migrant. He had this little house and and. Um, and one day we had the veranda and all he did make it a box up with packing cases and here's a brown snake and then he catches a bloody blue a shingleback lizard and yeah. a bearded dragon and then they come and then then he has to build cages, you know. And then eventually they, he buys a little block of land and we move out to there. Yeah. And then um, uh, you were saying also... Well, it's just like a backyard hobby that people want to come and see. Yeah, and then and then you started adding just a couple cents on like if they wanted to... Well, he had a... a, a, a on a, on a bin, yeah. Yeah. For yeah. 20 cents in the tin. And some, one day some young school kids came through and killed all his snakes in the pit. No. Yeah. Came in and just with, you know. Dead, no way. Yeah, yeah. That's hard. So then he went to the police and said, is there, any, can we, is there any law against charging people to come in? Mm. No. So we put a gate up and you had to pay to come in there. Yeah, okay, right. So That's that it. The and then he, he, he interacted with people. I've got uh, uh, a notebook from 1956 where he's selling snakes to other people in other states. Yeah. You could post them then in the post. In the post? Oh, gosh. Man, the posty. What a, yeah. what a life he had. Oh, he didn't know. Just a box with stuff in there. You know, send it up here to Queensland or New South Wales. Yeah, or right. Someone, and so, uh, that also showed me how animals have increased in numbers because mm. I remember a shingleback lizard, which are really common now, he was selling it for the same price as a goanna. They were rare back then. Mm. Shingleback lizards were rare. Yeah. And that's very different to today. Oh, okay. I, get, I catch a 50 shinglebacks in a day down in Renmark now. Yeah. And you're, you, there's a... There's that's from the fruit farms and stuff, see, food. Yeah. We, 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 with the expansion of people... We, exactly. We and it's even more sources. now because before when I was down, they had irrigation channels, mm. which were only, you know, water at certain times. But now right. we have drip irrigation. So there's a constant supply of water through so all of these things and all the trees I noticed when I was down there this time, especially in the almond plantations, the little earwigs, which are food for birds and lizards, yeah, they're yeah. just millions and millions of them everywhere. Really? So there's oh, food yeah. for everything now. It's yeah. just amazing. Yeah, and the, there was a couple other species you, um, you were talking about before that um, you didn't really see a lot of uh, well, Nearly everything. Nearly everything I can tell you. Birds, like 
grass parrots and bloody, you know, never saw a red, black cock, red pale black cockatoo. I got down to the river in the 70s. Yeah. Now you see them here all the time. Yeah. Uh, and then um, plovers? Did yeah, you oh, plovers. plovers. I was, when, I was at, when I was a kid, I used to collect eggs because you weren't these cards and things you had. So yeah, your hobby was cards. egg collecting <laughs> eggs and you'd collect eggs and swap them with other people like any kids would do yeah, yeah. from a, probably about age 7 to 18. I was into this thing, and in that period of time, I only found one plover's nest, hmm. ever. But now, that we took the dogs for, there's 30 out there on the lawn. Yeah. You know. There is a lot. Yeah. And <laughs> peewees, they're in flocks, they're in pairs. And another strange thing that struck me when I was down there, we used to get a thing called a grass parrot, a red rump parrot, and they were in pairs. You might see three. And we used to catch them with a trap and sell them to people that were keeping birds, me and my brother, for a bit of pocket money, right? Went back down in 19, 2007 with brother to brain tumour. These parrots are in mobs of 50 now. And the sparrows and starlings had declined. Yet they were telling us then that the sparrows and starlings would displace these birds. Right. Take over the nesting hollows, you know, but it's gone the opposite. Yeah. And nearly everything I've seen has been the opposite. Like bin chickens, like when you said, like, oh, from, yeah. you said that bin chickens were more rare back then. Oh, you had to go are. in a back swamp to see a bin chicken. Yeah, but now they're everywhere. That's right. I can't believe it. Like, the yeah. kookaburra was rare. Yeah. Everything was rare. Yeah. And now they're. Well, you just think about it. We put water every 16 kilometres for cows, mm -hmm. every 10 kilometres for sheep now. Mm -hmm. And then they have, the cow drops a turd and, of course, you go back, the flies are thick, mm. like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. Well, that's food okay. for insects, that's food for birds, that's food for frog, that's food for lizards. And now they've got water every 10 miles. Yeah. Or a bit, where before it would have been every 300 miles if you were lucky. Right, okay. I remember reading a book written and it was of the early settlers, journals and explorers. Mm. Now, it took them to 1871 to get across the Macquarie Marshes out of Sydney okay. and get to where Burke is today on the, on the Darling River. And in this journal it says when they hit the Darling in 1871, the water was salty in the Darling River that was left. They couldn't drink it, the animals couldn't even drink it. Because mm. it's a river which dries up every year. Mm. And if you have a drought, well, it's dried for more years than you'd want to consider. And it has no life in it whatsoever. Mm. And the River Murray now, which is, used to be the same, has got 16 locks on it. It's a 2,000-mile dam now. And what makes me laugh also is that on the River Murray, they talk about, oh, we need environmental flows. Mm. Well, there's a doubt, drought for 12 years. That river doesn't run mm. every year. No. So during a drought year, to be fair, you'd have to say, well, if it's going to be a drought year, we have no environmental flow. That's natural. You can have an environmental flow during a wet year. That's natural for the river, not right. what we've done. We've created an unnatural thing. An unnatural system, yeah. And there was another interesting thing. I was down in Renmark with the 2007 with brother. The newspaper put out a, a thing of yesteryear. And they had a, yeah, it was a yesteryear thing where they went and got a journal from someone from yep. before. And it was two young men went for a duck hunt. They rode 20 miles up river, mm. borrowed a boat and some shotguns and were going to send ducks back on the stagecoach which followed the river when they, they'd meet them and say, give your ducks to take back to these people. They were two weeks out there and they said if they hadn't taken food with them, they would have starved. It, it mentions not seeing a snake, mm. not catching a fish. This is in 1913. Okay. About 13 years after Brunmark was settled. Yeah, that's not In a pristine like a environment, yeah, yeah. they saw eight ducks, of which one they shot, but they couldn't get it. They fell across the other side of the river. Ugh. They thought they heard an emu. Yeah. They didn't find a kangaroo, and this is in 20 miles of a pristine river system, mm. never touched by humans, mm. you know. <laughs> they shot, I think it was two jays, a rabbit, a pigeon and a parrot. Right. In that period of time, they actually had carbide lights, which were torches at the time. Yeah. Went possum hunting, couldn't find a possum. Mm. Couldn't find a possum these days, no problem. Couldn't find a possum. Yeah. Thought they heard an emu, only shot a couple of rabbits who were introduced, mm. and a couple of jays and a pigeon and a parrot. Yeah. And they took corned beef with them. They said if they hadn't taken that, they would starve. They didn't even catch a fish. Mm. But you've got to remember, the river dried up every year. Mm. We've only got one river in Australia that runs all year round. Right, okay. And that's the Jardine that's fed by a spring from New Guinea. That's okay. in North Queensland. Okay. A lot of our little rivers on the side, if they trickle, they don't really run. Mm. A lot of the little, when it rains, they, they run. Yeah, yeah. We, all our rivers are what they call perennial, I think. They just run when it rains. Mm -hmm. And when I was at Edward River, it was amazing. Aboriginals would poison every waterhole that they could in any river. When it dried out, mm. any smaller waterhole was able to, they'd poison it to, just to kill the fish to send to the surface. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Was that with a, like a, a leaf, yeah, a kind yeah, of leaf yeah. that they right. put in the woods? We did it in the documentary to show people. Yeah. Was, yeah. And they did. There was many different leaves they could use. It was some up from a, a wattle tree they'd use. But anyway, they were poisoned. So you can imagine every river, even the Murray River, in a water hole was small enough mm. that 130 people could actually, which is about the size of the tribe, could throw enough leaf into poison they'd kill everything in it. And they couldn't even use that water till the next flush. So they weren't really environmentalists either in that respect. They had to, it was survival. Yeah, which is fair because you that's right. have everything that we that's have today. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's survival. So, you know, you think, hang on. So every river was then poisoned. So, And I find Australia or nature itself, I haven't seen a balance in nature. We keep being told that this balance. Now, if you call this a balance, I don't. This it's is a funky balance. balance. <laughs> that's a boom yeah. and a bust. Yeah. Boom. And a bust. And I wrote these books I've done yeah, to, yeah, to, to show books, yeah. people that, in, in, in layman's terms, that there ain't no balance out there. Mm. It's all boom and bust. And a classic example, I say, would be the Diamantina River, which it runs into Lake Eyre. Mm -hmm. It's got a series of water holes on it most of the time. Yep. And every maybe 20 or 30 years, you get a flood comes through. Yep. Floods into Lake Eyre. Lake Eyre, which is a salt lake, fills up and becomes fresh. Right, the freshwater lake then. And the few fish that are in these water holes get flushed down in that lake, yeah. breed up, so 100,000 pelicans are going to nest there. Mm. Maybe two or three times in that one year they'll have babies, mm. breed hundreds of thousands, feed on the fish that have just miraculously appeared. No, they grow fast, believe yeah. it or not, in this salt lake. Yeah. And then it dries up to nothing yeah, right. for another 30 years. Yeah. And there it goes. Spectacular. I suppose there's another little creature when I was in Renmark called a shield shrimp. Shield shrimp. Yeah, it looks like a little horseshoe crab. Okay. And when it rains in the desert, any little puddle or deeper puddle, they, they appear. Mm. These eggs have been sitting in this sand, dust, for 30 odd years in 30 to, or 50 degree heat. Mm. And when it rains, they hatch out and within weeks they become shield shrimps. Right. And when they're, while the water's there, they actually give birth to living young. And when it dries up, they lay both, eggs. Both egg and, right. They lay eggs, and the eggs sit there for another 30 bloody years. That's it. I think you can call it, what they call them, those uh, little monkeys you can buy, sea monkeys they call them. Yeah, okay. That's what they are. Right. You can actually buy this dust, put in water, and you get these little things come out. Huh. That's from a desert in America. They do it in America too. They're all over the world, these yeah, things. Yeah, now they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, they're, they're, it's a shield trip. And you think, well, wow, nature is so incredibly resilient. Mm. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah, to, to handle what, what especially what Australia has to throw at it. Uh, and so that's kind of like what your books are about. About, yeah. yeah and that's and make people use their brains to, to think a little bit. Don't yeah. get led along with the, you know, all this garbage that comes on. And I think the people want to be this spectacular stuff, you know. Oh, is this really dangerous? I'm good because I do it. Anybody can do what I do with a bit of a light. Next matter of fact, when we had our zoo in Airlie Beach, yeah. I wouldn't employ someone who <laughs> was in a zoo. Mm someone off the street who wanted a job was interested, I'd, I'd give him a job. And eventually I said, now, well, I put my hand in his mouth. You don't have to. Yeah. I'll tell you what's going to happen if you do. You know, but if you choose to, this is what you've got to do. Yeah. And we had one called Mick. He did it well. And Tony Gordon was another one yeah. who came and worked for me. And they all did that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, no one had any serious accidents at all. Yeah. And yet we were doing things that would be considered totally dangerous. dangerous. Right. But what we did, we left the animal be the animal and then use their instincts and then it becomes different, you know, it becomes... Once you understand something, it, it takes all the, 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 the danger out, I suppose. Mm. And that's then also, like, a, one of your series that you did, um, your yeah. episodes... We like tried to. I mean, it's hard instinct. in a way because Killer Instinct was actually... An American company wanted to do something because they'd seen what we'd done with the Barefoot Bushman. Someone must have seen it and said, oh, this guy looks all right. Yeah. And, like I said, the first six... Strapping the bloke. first six scripts they gave me, I threw them away. Yeah, I said, yeah. I can't do this. This is crap. Because no. you get a research and there's nothing about it. Then I was writing a script that they think might work for the audience that they think the audience wants to see. Well, I just want to be myself. So they can't write scripts for me. A lot of the stuff just comes out of my mouth. That's yeah. what I want. And it, it turned out all right as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, it does. I mean, people liked it. Yeah. It, it, like I said, when we did the Kissing Crocodiles once, the Barefoot Bushman one, as far as I understand, it was aired on the same night as State of Origin Football on another channel, Channel 7, mm. same time slot, and we equal rated with State of Origin Football. Yeah. That's Kissing Crocodiles one, and that was my first time. I was pretty nervous and I wasn't brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of the stuff that was in that didn't go to what the script was, because 
when they did this, I, I, I said to the cameraman, I'll put your camera here and do this and, and then let's do this. And I had an idea, let's do this. And it all worked. And that stuff got into the documentary rather than the stuff that they'd sort of... That they had set up yeah, tried, themselves. Tried what they might have set up, you know, yeah. what we wanted to do. I gave an idea what I wanted to do because... Yeah. Experience, your experience played a big part in actually making that Oh, film definitely. Success. Oh, yeah. All of them. And no matter where we went, I said, let's you know, put the camera, this will happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, and that's, well, I mean, it's quite a very. Ex, um... Well, to give you an idea, we did a, 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 a bloody um, commercial for Mitsubishi Pajeros many, a long time ago. We had to go to Australia. Yeah, okay. With it. And at the end, the film crew wanted me in their photo because they had such a good time with the animals. Right, and a classic example, we had a black snake there and wanted a black snake flattening to go across the sand. And they said, weren't the black snake? And I said, mate, if you can take your pants off and sit on that ground, I'll put the black snake down. There you go. Bullshit, you know? Yeah. Can you do it? No, I can't do that. I, yeah. I told them exactly what we could do. And they wanted a frill necklace to run at the camera. Yeah. How are you going to make that happen? I yeah. said, well, here we go. I said, well, get him, let him run, see which tree he runs to. Okay. okay, put your camera by that tree. I'll pull him back again. Yeah. <laughs> now we'll let him run. Run yeah. straight at the flame of camera. Yeah. Oh, that easy, you know, when you know what you're on about. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. And all that life experience that you'd had really That's right. had that fantastic. When you understand what the animal will do, you've got to, you can't make him run at that tree. You know what, what tree he wants to run to. Then you put yeah. the camera there. Okay, right. So you first tested it. Yeah. And then, and then you just yeah. pull him back. Okay, yeah, that's see. right. You let him run and catch him and have someone sitting by the tree, whatever it is, and grab him before he went up and then... Let him run. It was a tame one, but you'd put let him go. They'll run to a tree. Yeah, yeah. It's and if you want, and, and if like if you, they want to put the frill up, you just have a children's python out of shot and bring it towards him. He sits up and dances. Yeah, know? right. The secrets. <laughs> I see. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You've got it. Yeah. Well, that's um. There's there's. So uh, we know when you understand, you can make things happen. Yeah. Uh, and we can make it happen so really. Yeah, and and having like the family life that you've lived mm. um, has really allowed you to do that. And then that's right. you also for some of your kids as well. Um, now running uh, your family to help oh, run the right. park now. No, well, they help. They run. I don't. I'm not involved in that at all. I'm, yeah. I'm one of these people that you can't take it with you. And at the start of my shows, there I said, I, I said, I, the zoo, I said, own all the animals. That's if anybody can own anything on the planet because you can't take it with you. You can't own nothing. No. What's the point? Yeah. And being living with our bridges was one of those things that's, you need this, you use it. Mm. Like you get a person who buys a four-wheel drive and he doesn't want to scratch it. If I buy anything, ah, I, I want to use the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's here to use. It is. Yeah. And you use it. And simple as that. Yeah. Isn't it? So what? Be a bit standoffish mm. about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, and with um, uh, this kind of life you've kind of helped lead your family in, mm. um, did... Uh, was there much guiding that was needed uh, alongside with, or you just kind of push them in the deep well, end? Well, no, really. I, I, sort... To give an example, when I left home, I said, I'm never going to have a zoo. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that, that worked out. Well, because <laughs> <laughs> when you're kids, other kids are out playing, you're cleaning the flame of crocodile pools and rat cages. Yeah. That was okay. fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But then when I went to the army, you know, I was only a little short ass bastard. I was pretty tough, I suppose. <laughs> But you catch snakes, everyone's afraid of you. Yeah. <laughs> no one gave you shit, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, right on. That was just like a mark of like, get lost. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, no. And I was lucky because I had a CO who was pretty good and he gave me a special room to keep my reptiles in while I was there. I was sending them to Renmark because that time nothing was protected so I yeah. could catch stuff and do it. Yeah, yeah. I even was bringing stuff back from Vietnam. Yeah, right on. We got a permit to do it, but I was supposed to fly home, mm. but they were short of cooks, and I was a cook. So I said, would well, you mind going home on the ship? I said, oh, ship trip's good for me. Mm. But then somebody on the ship, I didn't make a secret. I had these animals. I had a reticulated pythons and bloody green tree vipers and ge toke geckos and some other agamid that looked like a bloody bearded dragon, but they looked like a painted dragon in colour. Yeah, right. You know, and, and um, a snake like a slaty grey snake, but had stripes all over it. Yeah. And... Um, a few other things, like mainly the pythons, and I was bringing them home. Yeah. And someone found out and the captain made me throw them overboard. No. Because under orders, you are still in war zone. Wow. So I had to throw them overboard. Oh, that's hard. Lucky enough, it was, it was close, fairly close to an island, so yeah, I thought... Yeah, so hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, hopefully. But I, I got my back, own back at them because I caught a heap of big cockroaches to feed these geckos because it was a 10-day trip and the geckos needed to feed, so fucking I let the cockroaches go on the ship. <laughs> Yeah, that is, a, that is a sneaky payback, yeah. waking up in the bed. Oh, I wonder what after, that That got me out of the army after I didn't want to be with them anymore. No, it's fair. Well, they, they just, they, there's no, right. like, a, that, I was that six year, I was a six-year soldier and I got out in three years when yeah. I came back. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and well, but you, that was but uh, it was funny, you know. And like I said, the, the photos of me made the war museum, you know, because this here's this guy catching snakes is good for you PR in back in home. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So yeah, we yeah, thought that. Right? Yeah, did the job. Yeah, well, it's it's um it's really uh, good that you you've, you've still got um, family that have stepped up and oh, are, yeah. are now doing this at the yeah. park. Just fed um, some of the stuff this morning. That yeah. was uh, very interesting. Um, you've got a good system working here with uh, uh, bringing people in, showing them oh, uh, what is really what true. Is, it's really a show park where people can touch everything, hold everything. It's not just looking, you know. Yeah. And and you it's go like in, interaction. You're going with the truck into the crocodiles. You're sitting in the back of the truck. We were on the ground, like you might have seen in those things, right? Yeah. Where the people can say, "Oh, shoot, you know, it's, yeah. it's right there." It's a yeah. lot more right personal there. than, than yeah, just all the ways back. Yeah. And um, uh, look, uh, before we get to the, um, before we close, overrated, underrated. Uh, the rules of the game is: if you think it's overrated, you say overrated. If you think it's underrated, say underrated. Uh, number one: uh, hunting for food instead of always going to the grocery store. Oh, I'll call that underrated. Underrated. Yeah, yeah, I think people should do more of it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Uh, number two, the public's fear of crocodiles. <laughs> That's overrated like you would not believe. <laughs> yeah, I, I would think so. That's right. Well, to, to, to give you an idea, yeah. to get eaten by a crocodile, you basically have to get drunk, mm. find a big hungry one and swim with him. Yeah. Then you might get eaten. Right. Yeah, and that doesn't happen all that often. No. No, uh, in, in one of your books you even gave s- s- statistics. It's about one person every four and a half years. Yeah, yeah, which is... If we could say bad. that about murder or yeah, car people. accidents yeah. or falling over at the bath. I'll be choking. It'd be great. The food is probably worse than yeah. eating by a crocodile. Yeah, the things kill ten a year. Right, yeah, okay, thank goodness um, I'm not allergic to bees. Yeah. Uh, number three, uh, natural medicines over artificial medicines. Probably overrated. Overrated, yep, okay. Uh, Living with Aborigines, they had a lot of natural medicines <laughs> that don't really work. Yeah, okay, okay. So the Australian nat- natural from the, from, the, from the environment Yeah. Well, really well, work. Well, you've got to think, most medicines originate from the environment anyway, and then we synthesise it to make it easier to make. Mm. And, but nothing on this planet can be made that's not already here. So whether you like it, it's all natural. Mm. Good way to look at it. Uh, number four. Now, mullets. Talking about the hairstyle. I don't know if you know what a hair... hair yeah, I know what yeah. mullets are. Yeah. What, do, what do you think about mullets? It's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Overrated. <laughs> Overrated. That's it. That's it. Uh, number five, final one. Uh, making time to get out of the home and get into nature. I think we should do more of it. Yeah, underrated. Yeah, it's underrated, yeah. 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 And then... Um, if and try to understand it. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and not just going out and being like, oh, on, on your phone and just yeah. kind of like getting to a destination but really, I guess, experiencing the process yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, well, uh, as we close, Rob, uh, could you give us um, uh, give some uh, wisdom from your life lived uh, for us young people living up and growing up in this na- world of nature. Okay. Um, we want to we want to do what's right. We want to do the, yeah. have the best impact we can have. Yeah. How would we go about doing yeah. it? Do not believe too much of the crap. Yep. There's a lot of stuff out there. They want your money mm. and that's what they want to do for you. Yep. To give you an idea, I've got a solar system on my house and I can say, oh, I'm great. I've got a solar system. I only put it on there because at the time they said you can get 44 cents a, a kilowatt, mm. right? That sounds right, yeah. yeah. And I'm paying 23. Yeah. So I, it made me money. Yeah, yeah. That's the only reason I did it. Not because of the environment thing. And already in nine just had to replace it. Right. And that's what people don't understand. You get this, I saw on the TV last night, there's something like 700,000 solar panels are going to go in, in somewhere near this Blake's place. Mm. In 15 years, or t- they're going to have to replace every one of those. Mm. And they're all going to be dug out, out of the ground again. Mm. And these ones they've got, they've got to be buried. Yeah. So if you think it's environmentally friendly, it is not. No. And that area that's underneath it, nothing can grow under there. Okay. Nothing can live under there. Mm. No, and like then the they were telling us a little like while ago about, oh, we should be painting all the roofs white because black absorbs heat. Solar panels are black. They are. They are black. Yeah, so they're all absorbing flame and heat. They're, they're counterproductive. Mm. Yeah. You tell me. Yeah. And these wind turbines kill so many birds, it's not funny. Right. Like already in, in Tasmania, they've killed like, so many eagles. Yeah, I oh know. You think, well, hang on. Environmentally friendly? It's a bit of an odd balance that you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, ain't it? <laughs> no, no. That's right. It's what I don't understand. Yeah. It's going to cost more 
to actually more environmentally unfriendly to do this than it is to be the other way. And and if you think about coal, I always say to people, they've written me a book, Coal is Trees, mm. that was up here once, got buried. Mm. So if we want those trees back up here, we have to dig that coal out, burn them, turn them into CO2 mm. so a tree can eat it again and become a tree again. Yes, right. So if you're talking about recycling, well, that's something we should be doing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Coal is not the problem. CO2 is not the problem. Mm. Water vapour is more yeah, heat, you're, heat absorbing. You're touching on that, yeah. yeah. Water vapour. Like I said, if they would have said to me that global warming is going to create more water vapour, plus then it kind of, that makes more sense than CO2. Because mm. CO2 is just plant food. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And that, when I read that, I was like, yeah, yeah. plant CO2 well, is plant There's food. A, a bloke called Professor Plymer who's written some books which I urge any young people to get and read. Because it's a bit along what I've done and, and try and get people to use their brain and critically think it out. Just don't believe everything. Say, so does that sound reasonable? And if it doesn't sound reasonable, most of the times it's not. Yeah, yeah, right on. Well, um, so yeah, pretty much the, the tip being don't believe everything you hear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the more money involved, the less you believe it. Okay, all right. More money, <laughs> less belief. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, well, thanks very much for coming Not on the podcast. Worry. It's been an absolute honour and pleasure. Um, if anyone would like to uh, get any of Rob's books that he has um, published, I'll uh, have details underneath uh, in the yeah, description. Them, yep. And then um, you'll be able to purchase them and get them as need be. Yep. But um, thanks for coming on. Uh, it's an absolute honour. And um, thank you for the inspiration also that you've been to myself uh, yeah, and well, helping me that I've... like gotten to where I am today in part. I mean, I started not wearing shoes when I was younger. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm wearing shoes now, um, but I started not wearing shoes. Well, I'm starting to wear them again too because my feet are getting Oh, we're, we're swapped out. Yeah, okay. Um, you, getting older. You, you're getting older. Cold, cold mornings, it's a bit hard. <laughs> the the shoes, the, the the looking for wildlife, the um, wanting to make a difference yeah. in this world, you've definitely yeah. impacted that positively yeah. and I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, that's it. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope you have learned something new and this has opened your mind and your eyes to what is happening around us. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.